Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Interrupting the conversation here uh, reminds me of what uh, it brings me back to what a chairman of the Fed said when the Fed used to do what it was meant to do was to take away the punch bowl when the party was just getting going. And uh, that's sort of my role here, which is to interrupt the conversation just when it's uh, at its peak and to turn to the subject at hand. Uh, today, as everyone knows, is the Arthur Ross Book Award uh, event, which I believe is one of the uh, most important and valuable events that we do here in the course of, of, of the year. This is an award that's given for excellence in books about foreign policy and international relations. And when you look at the pedigree of the awards that, uh, the books that have been awarded over the years, uh, it's really quite an extraordinary list of authors and books from Bob Skidelsky for his uh, work on, on Keynes, Samantha Powers' book, uh, the book by our own Steve Simon and Dan Benjamin on terrorism. Steve Cole's book, Ghost Wars, which remains uh, as powerful and as relevant as it was uh, when he wrote it, I think. Tony Judd's book on Europe. Uh, Kwame Appiah's book on uh, cosmopolitanism. Paul Collier's book on the bottom billion. And then this year, uh, Philip Pan's book. It's an extraordinary array of uh, intellectual and literary excellence. What I, what I like particularly about this year is, besides how good the book is, that it's about Asia. It's obviously about China, and Arthur Ross was uh, so passionately interested in those uh, subjects. He was also in passionately interested in other subjects. Indeed, by definition, any subject that Arthur was interested in, he was passionately interested in it. As I learned when he agreed with something I said or wrote, and as I also learned when he disagreed with something I, uh, I, I, I said uh, or wrote. One of the nice things about where I live, which is uh, – right next to the park is uh, I live right next to about, about 100 yards away from the Pinetum. And so one of the things that I do regularly uh, with my wife and my kids is we take walks and it gives me a chance uh, to think about Arthur and just to thank him for what he did, not just for the park, but what he did for this institution and for this city. And he really did, uh, I think, extraordinary uh, things. And he did it with uh, energy and he did it with uh, real concern uh, and he was one of these people I know who cared not just about people in the abstract and about mankind, but also cared about people as individuals. Uh, so I miss him, but this is one of the ways that I, I, I th we remember him and can basically say thank you. And it's uh, particularly great that Janet is here uh, today with us. So Janet, it's great to see you again. Uh, here. I'm not going to go on and say a lot about the book or the process other than to say that the, the process of coming up with the uh, award winners each year, and there are three, is arduous. And an awful lot of work goes into them. Uh, there's the screening and there's the reading, there's the uh, debating, there's the judging, and none of this would happen without a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Hogue who, uh, when he's not working in this in his spare time, puts out uh, the best magazine in the world that deals with international subjects and does it six times a year. And in case you hadn't noticed, in between these six publications a year, now uh, oversees an extraordinarily interesting and valuable website that essentially fills the space for each, uh, between, or is it among, those, uh, each of those, uh, those, those issues. So if you haven't been on foreignaffairs.com, you're, you're, you're missing a great bet. So I, uh, I recommend it. Uh, so let me uh, turn to Jim to thank him and his colleagues uh, for the work uh, they do, congratulate them on their extraordinarily good judgment, because it wasn't easy. When you look at the other books they, uh, they, 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 they had to uh, choose from, and again, to uh, thank all of you for coming here to celebrate uh, both the memory of uh, Arthur Ross and the excellence of uh, this year's uh, book produced by Philip Pan. So Jim, over to you, sir. Thank you, Richard, very much, and welcome, everybody. I see a lot of old friends in here. 
We had quite a year this year. There are more books than I can recall, and that, I guess, should not surprise anybody. All you need to do is take a look at what's going on in this world. There's an awful lot to write about and to think about. But we had not only a lot of books, we had some really terrific ones, as I think you will hear in just a minute. As Richard said, the process has three or four different stages. The first is a nominating committee, which is made up of uh, 22 leading scholars and practitioners of foreign policy, drawn from a variety of fields, some of whom are here with us today. Now, they select a pool of 24 books for the jurors to consider. And the jury has the task of winnowing the group of books down to a final short list. And that short list the jury came up with uh, consi consisted of six books on a diverse range of topics. Gareth Evans, The Responsibility to Protect Ending Mass Atrocity Crimes Once and for All. Dexter Filkin's The Forever War, about Afghanistan and Iraq. Philip Penn's Out of Mayo's Shadow, The Struggle for the Soul of a New China. Kevin Phillips, Bad Money, Reckless Finance, Failed Policies, and the Global Crisis of American Capitalism. Ahmed Rashid for Descent into Chaos, the United States, and the Failure of Nation Building in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. And Jeremy Saltz, The Unmaking of the Middle East, A History of Western Disorder in Arab Lands. <clears throat> the jurors uh, who accompanied me in these exercises were and are Stanley Hoffman, Bob Kagan, Miles Kaler, Mary Surratt, and Stephen Walt. Our final task as jurors was to pick this year's three winners. And after a lot of deliberation, the jury picked three books to be honored. The first with a $5,000 prize and an honorable mention goes to Gareth Evans for the responsibility to protect. He would be with us today, but has a commitment in Brussels where he's been working for the last few years. The jury then chose the silver medal and a prize of 7,500 to be given to Ahmed Rashid for descent into chaos, the United States and the failure of nation building in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. He had a commitment in Dubai today and couldn't break away to come here for lunch and get back there in time. So we miss both of them. This afternoon's uh, book sheds light on the struggle against China's repressive regime by bra uh, brave individuals who are seeking a freer and more just society for the world's most populous nation. And the jury is very pleased to award this year's Arthur Ross Book Award gold medal and a $15,000 check to Philip Pan for Out of Mao's Shatter, Shadow, The Struggle for the Soul of a New China. So please join me in congratulating him as he comes to the stage. Can you join us, Richard, for a picture? Here's the medal. Well, if we can just take our seats now, we'll get going. Oh, yes. Very good. Well, the mic check test first. Mine's on, I think, right? Is mine working? I think so. Okay. Very good. Just briefly, who is Philip Pan? I think you all have a pretty good idea. He is a foreign correspondent. He's currently on assignment for the Washington Post in Moscow. But from 2000 to 2007, he was the newspaper's uh, Beijing bureau chief. <clears throat> Before that, he 
graduated from Harvard College and studied Chinese at Peking University. Today he's studying Russian. <laughs> he's won several top <clears throat> journalism awards for his international coverage. Now, in general, I think we're all aware of China's growing prosperity and power, and we think about it a lot. I think we are less aware because it's tough to get as much coverage for, for, the <clears throat> for things that China doesn't like as what they do like. And so I think we're less aware of the struggle that's going on in China uh, against a repressive political regime by citizens who are seeking, as we said earlier, a freer and more just society. Philip has chosen in his book to throw a light on this emerging struggle through vivid reporting of the heroic and unfortunately often hopeless challenges mounted by a handful of brave individuals. The book opens with a chapter on the funeral of the reform-minded Communist Party boss Zhao Jiang, who resigned in protest for the Tiananmen Square crackdown 20 years ago. He then spent 16 years in anonymity and house arrest before his death four years ago. Now, this month happens to be the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen. Uh, it happened on June 4th. And it's marked, among other things, by publication outside of China of Zhao's memoirs. And in them, he says in no uncertain terms that the crackdown was illegal by Chinese law, as well as anybody else's ethics or legal framework, and that the um, violent suppression was a great tragedy. This year, um, his funeral has been marked by far more attention by Chinese than um, one would have expected since, as I said, he was 16 years in a state of almost enforced anonymity. But thousands of Chinese came out against various sort of pressure tactics to keep uh, a memorial from happening. And uh, I think one of the reasons for that is that it may seem like Tiananmen Square has been erased from history by China's um, um, uh, sort of efforts at rewriting history, but it is still there. And s since the opening chapter is literally about uh, one aspect of the Tiananmen Square um, protest and s subsequent massacre, I thought that would be a good place to start. So um, tell us a little bit about what happened with the, f the f funeral this year and what it meant as far as you can tell. Maybe I could just first thank you and, and Mrs. Ross and, uh, and the other judges for, for recognizing the book. It really is an honor. And I also wanted to thank um, uh, Simon & Schuster and Alice Mayhew and uh, my colleagues at the Washington Post, uh, without whom this book wouldn't have been possible. And also uh, my wife, who, who couldn't make it today, but she edited the book. And if there are any aspiring authors out there looking for an editor, she's available. <laughs> uh, the, the funeral, which was the... the um, the scene of, the, of uh, the first chapter of the book, uh, uh, I, th I thought it was remarkable because, um, as you said, uh, people uh, were refusing to forget what happened in 1989. Uh, now, we're, you know, we're 20 years past uh, the massacre now. And if you, if you, you know, I think the common perception is, and I think there's truth to this, is that most Chinese have forgotten what happened. Uh, this is not by accident. This is a a product of a deliberate effort by the government. Uh, now, the, the book is about the struggle for the future of the country, but one of the battlegrounds for the, of this struggle is really the struggle to define the past. And they've, they've done all they can to sort of write history in a way that favors uh, their continued rule. Um, and what I was surprised by uh, when I went to this funeral was, was how many people were refusing to forget, that despite all of this effort by the government uh, to, er to erase the memory of 1989 and to, er to erase this figure who had basically stood up, uh, I think the only figure in, in communist history to have stood up in this way, uh, to stood up to the, to the, to the, the use of violence like this. Um, and that there were, you know, in, in this crowd of people who had come, they were uh, it really, I thought, was a, a sign of hope for this country that people, uh, despite all, against all the odds, there was really no benefit for them to come to this funeral. And, and there certainly were a lot of risks to come to the funeral. They, the, the state security was there with cameras and, um, and taking down people's names. Um, so that, and people's careers would be affected. Uh, 
sometimes uh, the freedom could be taken away, and yet they still came to this funeral. So I thought it was just a powerful testament to uh, uh, what I think um, is often overlooked, which is the notion, you know, I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is that uh, there's this notion that the Chinese people don't care about uh, democracy or about political freedom anymore, that they only want to get rich, and, and this was uh, evidence otherwise. Now, at the end of the Tiananmen Square uh, atrocity, there was speculation that this might, if not a mortal blow, it certainly diminished the authority, credibility, the reputation of the reigning regime. They've certainly done quite a job turning that around. What are some of the lessons they learned and applied that has led to their, at least in terms of strength and capabilities, their resurrection? After uh, 1989, I think there, there was a lot of speculation that this, uh, that this government wasn't going to survive. And um, you know, we've seen completely the opposite. Um, I think there, there are a couple reasons why. Uh, one I mentioned is this control of history, and I think they've really mastered that. Um, another is, is that even as they were cracking down on, on these demands for democratic reform, uh, within, uh, within a year they had reversed course and, 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 and embraced market uh, reforms again. Um, there was, a, I think, maybe a year or two, a period where they were uh, hesitant. Um, but then um, uh, Deng Xiaoping came, came forward and really uh, pushed market for reforms back to the forefront. And one lesson that um, I think we can draw is that this notion that uh, capitalism um, leads automatically to democracy, that free, free markets lead to free societies, that once income levels reach some uh, uh, magic point, the, the, that political change is going to come automatically. I, I think they've proven that that's uh, not necessarily so, that it's not an automatic process. Um, that it, you know, when political change comes, it's the, it's the result of uh, individuals who are taking risks and, 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 and fighting for it, and it's a, it's a messy process. And so um, that's, I think that's what we're continuing to see to this day. And that leads us right into the book, because the book, as I said, is a series of portraitures, very vivid, of individuals who are, I'm not sure they would say this consciously, but are experimenting with other ways to pursue some political and social change since the mass effort um, illustrated by Tenement did not like, look like a good road to go down at this time. What, uh, um, let me just tick off what some of the uh, stories in the book are centered on, the individuals, and then you can sort of tell us what is a common thread that goes through these experiences. And is there anything to be hopeful about? Because I must say in the book, most of these very brave individuals end up in a lot of pain, if not in jail, and with accomplishments that may come in the future but haven't come yet. But among the portraitures that you'll find in this book are a documentary filmmaker, a prolific blogger, um, a memorial taker trying to keep in place a cemetery of uh, fallen dead from the Cultural Revolution, a labor organizer trying to create a, a fairer deal in the workplace, um, a defender of, peasant, of peasants' rights, an organizer, uh, an outspoken doctor, a crusading newspaper man, a blind lawyer, um, and then opponents to a corrupt real estate developer, sort of the queen of Beijing real estate, and uh, un of oppressive party bosses in the provinces. Uh, is there a common thread to these people that you chose? I, I think there is. And, and Besides their bravery? Uh, yes, I, I think there is. I think um, you know, one of the reasons this, we subtitled the book The Struggle for the Soul of a New China is that I really do think that what we're seeing, it, it's a chaotic process, but I do think we have battle lines that have been drawn. That on, on one side you have the, the party state, um, and uh, really millions of people who benefit from uh, its continued uh, existence. And on the other side, uh, there is this ragtag collection of, 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 of uh, you know, artists and lawyers and, and writers and journalists uh, and um, a variety of different uh, civil society activists. Um, uh, they have a different vision for what the country uh, should be and can be. Um, they, they, they see a more open and more tolerant, uh, 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 more just uh, China. And it, it, I think it's in conflict uh, to a large degree with, with uh, what the folks on the other side see. And so that's what I think holds them together. 
Now, it looks to me as if one of the lessons the regime learned from Tiananmen was um, you've got to embrace capitalism, then you've got to distribute the goodies of it to your business and social elite, your political elite, so that they become your allies rather than your opponents, that you've got to enlarge a little bit the space for personal li um, liberty, yep. but be very quick and very decisive in stamping down any real dissent against the nature of the political regime. Part of the trick is knowing, for them, I think, has been knowing when to retreat. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you talk about how the, the book can be depressing. I, um, you know, I set out not to write a really depressing book. I was quite hopeful uh, about the prospects uh, for change when I left because of these in individuals. I, I was hoping it would be a more inspiring in book. And um, I, I think uh, you know, if, if you look, depending on how you look at the, at the picture, I think it can, you can say, well, there hasn't been a lot that's changed. The, the situation is still dire, and uh, people are losing this battle. But um, if, I think if you, if you step back, you'll see that the party actually has been retreating. Um, and that's one reason that they're staying in power. So it's sort of a, uh, you know, a catch-22 situation. You know, they, by, by stepping back, they're giving people more freedom. But they're also, that's the smart thing for them to do if they want to stay in power. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard path to chart. It goes kind of like this. Yeah. For example, let's take a couple of recent developments. There seems to be a new crackdown on the internet uh -huh. underway. Uh -huh. They've uh, just arrested and jailed a, a dissident. They've gone after Google, and now they're insisting that PCs that are shipped into the country have a filter bro uh, mechanism built in, supposedly, to get rid of pornography. Uh -huh. But it's just as easy to use it for lots of other things, right? And it's already set up to use for other things. Yeah. But it's interesting. There is such an... Uh, other things being political of comment. Of course, political right. comment. If you, if I think people have looked at the software already <clears> and um, found uh, lists of uh, words and names that, that, that would be blocked from showing up. Um, and, and there's also other problems with this software as well. But you know, there, there's, I think there's been such an outcry already over uh, this software that the government, if, not, uh, if they haven't already, they're in the process of retreating on this. And they're only going to require that the, the, the software be shipped with the computer, but not necessarily put on the computer. Um, and I think that was smart for them to back down on this. You know, they, they're very, um, uh, you know, you, you listed a, a whole series of, of, of bad news. But I, I think um, that uh, one thing that, that uh, is, as you say, it's a tricky, a tricky path. And the, but they've been yeah. very good at it. They know exactly how far to push in and, and when to back down. And how long they can keep this sort of ballet up is, is an open question. Well, I was about to get to that, which is it seems to me looking at it from outside that they have a principle they're following, which is when dissent or capability of dissent look like they could be dangerous, let's mm -hmm. clamp fast. But they make the decisions kind of on an ad hoc basis depending on how they read the scene. Um, I don't want to overemphasize this point. The regime strikes me as being in a pretty stable situation for quite some time to come. But at the same time, the number of protests and the nature of protests in China has been rising dramatically. Some of the protests now are, could be described as middle class folks mm -hmm. and on middle class lifestyle issues like pollution, uh, working conditions, and so on. And some of the negotiations we've had on a possible Chinese language addition to foreign affairs, we really noticed the zigzag. They will talk to us and we'll get very far down the road and then suddenly their eyes glaze and don't call us, we'll call you. And we still don't have a Chinese language edition. And if you, if you chart or pinpoint the glazed eyes times we've had over the last five years, they tend to correspond with other things that suggest the Chinese are getting concerned, that things are getting a little too free. Is that the case right now? As I say, there are a number of things to point to. Charter 08 is another one, where I think they've just thrown the authors of this um, call for democracy proclamation in the jail for some rather large long time, time span. They're, they're very insecure. They, and they, they recognize um, that their sort of claim to power is, 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 uh, is weak. Um, and so they, they're, they're running around putting out fires. And they, they, they um, you know, it could be the Charter 08. It could be the protest here. I mean, I think there's, there's uh, almost <coughs> 100 protests a day now going on. And, yeah. Um, but they've been very good about uh, you know, one of the lessons they drew from Tiananmen is, is learning how to keep these protests from developing into a national movement. Keep them local, yeah. And I think another critical lesson that they've learned is that they have to stick together. And this is, I think, a key 
uh, factor for the success of this government. That the, in the, within the elite, they know that they have to stick together. They can't fight it out over corrupt spoils or over different policies. They know that they have to, because uh, if they get divided, as they did in 1989, and, and they get paralyzed, then this, and then the whole thing could come tumbling down for them. And so they have this sense that they're, they're in it together, and I think that's been key to their success. Um, we're here to talk about China, but it's, uh, we are also at the moment watching, I think, with um, a poll. It's not Tiananmen Square, but it's, it's in the same genre, so to speak, what is going on in Iran right now. And some people have begun to speculate, is this another Tiananmen? I think that's um, too broad. But the question again, of uh, can the regime resurrect itself after a pretty good stumble uh, is going to be upon us here over the next few months? My own reading, uh, you're sitting in Moscow these days, and I think we'd be interested, even though it's a little off the topic of the book, in how you see the Russian attitude about what's going on in Iran. My own feeling about the regime is that it does not have the capabilities, uh, the resources um, that the Chinese had to fully resurrect their authoritarian brand of capitalism and of politics. Uh, and that we're probably looking at a very tough repressive period ahead in Iran, and then probably a sequential decline of the current or, or almost a forced change in the nature of it. I think one of the, um, we talked about lessons that the government drew from uh, Tiananmen, but another uh, thing to remember is the lessons that the public, that society right. draw from an incident like that. And I think uh, for most Chinese, the lesson from Tiananmen was we can't do that again because we'll lose. <laughs> that uh, right. you know, we, we, you know, we have to push for change. If we're going to push for change, we have to do it another <coughs> way because this government is willing to uh, resort to violence. Um, and so we need to find a way to try to push for change without directly challenging the one-party system. And a lot of, um, of uh, Chinese activists are sort of playing this game where they, they appeal to the, uh, to the Communist Party and its own laws and, and try to use that to, to push forward change. Um, I think, you know, I'm not an expert at all in, in Iran. I've never been there. But my sense is that a different lesson is going to be drawn by the public there. I don't think necessarily that they're going um, to draw the lesson that, you know, we can't win um, and that they're going to back down. So I, I think that'll be interesting to watch. How conscious is China of how it is perceived in the world? Again, uh, we'll get off of Iran here in a minute, but it, it, it appears as this administration does not have that as a priority, the current Iranian. Mm -hmm. they're, they're willing to get all of us angry and upset with them to, to um, sustain their power and their privileges. Uh, one has a little bit different sense about the Chinese. And if so, when stories like the ones you have documented come out, and when there are more protests, and the internet provides more chances for people to learn about what's going on, how much is their sense of their standing in the world affected by these developments? I think the way to look at it is that the, the leadership in China, they're most concerned about domestic stability and about maintaining power. They want to stay in power. They want to keep this going. Um, they're concerned about world opinion to the extent that it, that'll affect that mission. So if, um, you know, they feel that the sort of respect that they get from the world and from other countries it benefits them domestically. You know, they, uh, you know, they, they call themselves the Communist Party, but they're really not a, uh, pushing any sort of Marxist ideology anymore. And it's a completely, uh, uh, almost a completely a market economy now. So they don't have that claim to ideology for, for justifying why they're in power. So they need other things. And uh, world respect is one of the things that they crave and that they need in order to, to say to their own people, look, this is, you know, we're a great country. We're delivering, you know, this to the public, and that's why that justifies our, our continued rule. So the, I think they do respond to public opinion, and, and probably much more so than Iran. Does that provide any openings? For example, there is um, objections being raised right now mm -hmm. with the WTO and the Congress of the United States and so on, on this latest move to get our big companies, Google, Yahoo, so forth, to cooperate with the Chinese efforts to, <coughs> to constrain what you can do over the internet. Is, 
What are our chances of prevailing on something like that? Well, I, I think that we probably have a lot more leverage on, uh, on, Chinese than, on the Chinese government than we think. I think um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a tricky situation, and it sort of parallels the sort of moral dilemmas that some of the activists I write about face. You know, they, they reach a situation where uh, they know they're going to be faced uh, with a violent response that could damage, you know, hurt them and their families and other people. And they sort of have to make this decision about whether to press forward or to, to compromise. Um, I think you know, foreign nations dealing with the Chinese face a similar situation. When, they, when we push them on, on democracy, sometimes they can use that to uh, their own advantage. You know, they can use it to, to rally um, sort of nationalist sentiment within the country. So it's a, a, a tricky path. But I do think that there are, there are several things that you know, we can do uh, on the margins that, ha that have an impact. And one is, is corporate responsibility. The American companies there, I think, could probably do a lot more on, in, uh, in pushing forward not only uh, you know, freedom of information, but also uh, uh, labor standards, I think, uh, that, that, that could make a big difference. Because they really do depend on on foreign investment. Um, I think, um, you know, my book is about individuals and about, um, my argument is that it's, it, you know, that change comes because of these individuals who, who are willing to push for change. And I think that, uh, you know, the government, you know, the United States government and other governments could probably do more to focus attention on individual cases. You know, there's, I think some people like to say that, well, these are just individual cases. That's not going to really change the system there. But I think there's evidence, you know, in other nations that if we hadn't pushed for uh, Nelson Mandela's release, you know, maybe the course of South African history would have been different. And so I think we should continue to raise the cases of some of these individuals, and, and I think uh, the, the Chinese government would respond in some cases, and they have already. Now, a lot of people say that the Obama administration's uh, general posture towards China is one that is a bit muted from calls for democracy and so on, focuses on other things, economic relationships, so forth. What's your own view of... Um, how we are, and I, I know it's very early in the administration, but how we're positioning ourselves for the relationship with China over the next four years. Well, I think we've had some mixed signals from the Obama administration on this. You know, Hillary Clinton on her first trip um, uh, to China basically said right out that she wasn't going to raise human rights issues. But um, we've also seen um, the State Department and, and, the, and the White House continue to issue uh, statements uh, about the situation in China. And so I, I don't think they've quite settled yet on how, uh, on an approach to this question. I think they recognize that our, our leverage is limited because of the, our economic situation and um, especially, the, you know, the, um, you know, all the treasuries that the, the Chinese government holds. Right. And so they, they're, they're quite sensitive to that. Um, they, I don't think that, I think there's a debate, I, mean, I was just in Washington yesterday, we were talking about Russia policy, but I think there's, there's still a debate within the, the administration about how to push, how, to what extent uh, should we be pushing forward values um, such as uh, the freedom and democracy? And to, to what extent, do, when we do that, it becomes you know, a negative. And I think they're still sorting that out right now. You mentioned a moment ago that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things, certainly before Tiananmen, but, but very de definitely afterwards, was the uh, almost obsession with keeping a very high growth rate mm -hmm. and a form of crony capitalism to keep the business and entrepreneurial establishment with them. Now, you know, a lot of poli-sci texts, and I'm sure you've read them as well as I, uh, posed that the middle class is really the revolutionary class in societies. And if you can't satisfy them, they're the ones that can topple you. Any signs at all in a break in the love affair is too strong, but the allegiance of the business and economic world with the current regime? I think there's, there's some sign of this, but there's also, I, I write about in the book, a, uh, you mentioned her, the, the developer who's the queen of real estate in, yes. in Beijing. She's a prime example of how effective the party has been at um, uh, basically uh, cultivating support in, in the business community. You know, the, we sort of assumed that private entrepreneurs would be at the forefront pushing for uh, political change because they, they want courts that can resolve disputes, they want their property rights protected. They want some say in, in, in establishing government and policy. But we've, what you see, there's a group of entrepreneurs and business people in, in China who are successful primarily because of their connections to the party. You know, as they were making this transition from uh, a planned economy to a market economy, markets were opening up. And if you could get access to those markets, you could make a fortune. And the, only, and the best way to get access to those markets was to have a connection with a party official. And so many of these people 
um, they owe their, their fortunes uh, to, to their uh, party relationships. And this, this woman, when I interviewed her, I asked her what she thought of the one-party system, and she said it was great. She, you know, it, it had obviously done very well for her. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there is a growing uh, uh, dissatisfaction in, in the middle class with, with this government. You know, this government has shown that a one-party system can deliver economic growth. Um, it's but shown also that it's has shown that they can produce an awful lot of corruption, right? It's, yes, but they've also shown that they can get world respect. Um, but they haven't been able to demonstrate whether they can deliver other sort of public goods that, mm. uh, that the middle class expects. Good health care, better school system, just courts. These are a clean environment is a becoming a big issue for, for people. Um, it's not clear whether the authoritarian system can do as well on, on, some, on delivering some of these things. And so uh, you see in Shanghai and other cities um, scattered protests uh, on, all, on a whole range of issues. Mm -hmm. um, and corruption uh, is the top one, I think. And that is probably where they're most vulnerable. Now, there have been some experimentations with democracy at a very local level. And there have been lots of announcements about uh, the evolution and expansion of the rule of law in various areas. But as your book points out, an awful lot of uh, the law that's being passed is also being used in some very clever ways, not really in the interest of justice, but in the interest of a special interest. Well, there's a, there's well, what, what would you say about where we are in the role of law in China? Well, I think there's a real struggle over uh, defining what rule of law is in China right now. The traditional view in China of the law is that it's a tool that the, the rulers use to regulate right. the behavior <clears throat> of the public. And this is, I think, to a large extent, how the party thinks of rule of law. Um, but I think that it's the, the genie is out of the bottle. I think for much of the public, they have a different view of what law should be. They see it as a as a, a, a weapon to defend themselves, to defend their own rights, and they believe uh, that party officials uh, should uh, not be above the law. That par the party itself should be under the law as well. And so you have a, a, a whole generation of uh, civil rights lawyers now uh, actively pushing this. Um, this sort of concept and, and filing lawsuits and basically using the party's own rhetoric about rule of law against it. Um, you know, they've, they've run into a lot of problems. It's, it's not, it's not going to be a straight line process where they can just push forward and, and succeed. Um, but I think uh, already the public consciousness of, of what law means has already changed. We're going to go to the floor for some questions. Towards the end of the book, um, you had what I thought was a very evocative sentence that reads as follows. Society in China is racing forward, but the political system is stuck in the past, struggling to preserve power and privileges. Does that about sum up where we are and what it's going to be like for the immediate future? I think that's exactly where we are. I think the, uh, the strains on this system are going to be even more intense in, in this economic uh, crisis that we're in. You know, one, one of the things that, um, uh, that's kept them in power is this growth that they've been able to deliver. Yeah. That's now in jeopardy. Um, whether the other sort of tools they have in their chest are going to be enough is, uh, you know, that, that's something we're going to be watching, I think. Okay, some questions. Uh, please tell us who you are and wait for a microphone. Yes. I'm Ellen Eisen. Microphone is coming right now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ellen Eisen. I'm Arthur's niece, very proudly. I'm proud of Arthur and happy to be here today. I just wondered, um, you've spoken about uh, uh, financial and political pressures on China, and I just wondered whether you, from the cultural standpoint, thought the U.S. and other Western governments and democratic governments were doing enough to put pressure on um, through cultural means in terms of student exchange programs and a host of other cultural outlets. I think we're, we're uh, doing quite a bit already on that front. Um, and I think that, uh, that has a positive impact from, from where I was sitting in Beijing. I think um, you know, there have been calls you know, to, cut, to cut off uh, some of these activities, to, to apply sort of sanctions of some sort. Uh, I don't think that would necessarily be effective. I think um, you know, the engagement that we've had w with Chinese society especially has, is, is one of the reasons why for example, we talked about the change in the view of the law. It's, it's because of their interaction with the rest of the world. It's because they've, they've watched American movies and read American books, and they've seen you know, uh, Law and Order. I don't know what, what other shows are quite popular there. But they've seen this, and, and they understand it works differently elsewhere in the world, and they, and they, they want the same thing there now. So I think um, 
uh, you know, I haven't studied the, the, the question. I don't know how much government support there is for these types of activities, but I, I think um, it, it's quite obvious. I mean, when I was a, a student uh, in Beijing in, in the early 90s, you know, I, I could recognize all the foreigners living there. Now, I think there are hundreds of thousands of foreigners living in Beijing, and, and it has an impact on the everyday, uh, uh, you know, you know, everyday rhythm of life there. And I, I think, um, you know, the party had to let the <coughs> this happen in order to keep the economy going, but I think this is going to be a weakness for them. Let me ask you a question about that, because um, you're now in Russia. Russia desperately needs, <coughs> you know, a fairly full, fulsome immig immigrant yeah. policy because they have a declining population, but they have rising and very violent ethno-nationalism going on. On the other side of China, in certainly a quiet form, the Japanese also needing a larger workforce still is very, very resistant to anybody but Japan spending time on that island. What's the Chinese public attitude about suddenly becoming much more mixed in the environment rather than straight Han? What do you mean? Uh, well, you well, said lots of foreigners are now oh, in I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, you don't you don't see the sort of backlash that you see in Russia. There's mm. that's, there's you know there's a degree of racism in Chinese society. And so darker skinned people, I think they they face uh, uh, some degree of discrimination in China, of course. But you don't see the sort of violence. You don't. I don't. I haven't heard anything about a um, uh, anti foreigner movement really mm. in San Pino there. Um, you know, occasionally the for political purposes that's whipped up, and you know, so you see. These rallies against the Japanese every once in a while calls for, for boycotts. They, they play on the history. Well, they're downplaying that now, are they not? They, the government is a little worried about uh, that getting out of hand, yeah. you know. And also, I don't think there's that much of an on, uh, a market for that type of sentiment, you know. They, they're, these activists, some of them, you know, I, I think quite um, sincere, you know, uh, uh, nationalists. Uh, they, they were calling for these boycotts of Japanese goods, and and um, you know, they, they never got off the ground. People. Just want to buy those goods. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, there we go. Anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, Stephen Blank, North American Transportation Competitiveness Research Council. I want to push the argument, your the analysis, just a bit further. The tasks ahead uh, for China are enormous. To bring what half a billion, eight hundred million, nine hundred million more people into a modern economy, to create the public goods you talked about in education and health, to create a sustainable uh, uh, society and economy. Uh, what kind of government do you think could do this? Would a democratic government manage to do this? There aren't a lot of precedents in developing countries uh, to, to suggest this. So what are we looking for? Well, that, that, you know, it's a, a hypothetical question, what a democratic government would look like in China. Um, I think uh, democratic reforms would certainly help them achieve this. I think... Uh, the fact that they're uh, trying to, con to, to control the Internet the way they, they are, the fact that they... Um, By the way, is it controllable to the extent that they would like? I, I or is this ultimately feckless? No, I, I think for people <coughs> who want to use the Internet to find information, they, they will get around all of these firewalls. Mm. It's, 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 it's not very difficult. Um, the problem is that in, is not that many people are interested. Um, and the government is... Um, you know, they only just have to make it difficult enough for people to sort of, ah, that's, that's a pain, I'm not going to bother. And they've been, you know, that, so they can do that, and, that, and they're, they're quite good at that. Um, but the, I do think that, you know, uh, this system has shown it can deliver a great deal. You know, 20, in the last 20 years, they've uh, lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty already, and they, they've built, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, the infrastructure in, in this nation, you know, it, the growth of it is it's just amazing, especially compared to, to, to Russia. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't know the exact figure, but there have been thousands of miles of roads built in China over the last eight years. And, and in that same period in Russia, the number, amount of roads has actually shrunk. Uh, and during both of periods of, of both of uh, economic growth. So there's something that this system is doing right. Um, but I do think that if they were more responsive to the public, if they were more open to debates, uh, they're going to be more effective in meeting some of these challenges. Um, and I think there are people within the party uh, who think this way as well. Um, I think they're in the minority right now. Somehow they have to maintain a balance between participation and a government that is nimble enough, focused enough to accomplish these goals. Yes, right? yes. They're, not, they're, they're quite nimble now, but I, don't, I think they would be more nimble if they opened up uh, a little bit more, uh, maybe a lot more. Bill? 
<clears throat> I'm interested in on how China sees us. Uh, I was interested, as you described, the Chinese real estate developer mm -hmm. and the form of corruption, presumably. It's, I mean, that's so endemic in America. And it's so, there's so many <clears throat> fortunes in America that are directly related to the political power structure. I wonder how the Chinese look, for example, at our election in the year 2000 and how it was resolved, or how we went to war against Iraq, or what has happened in the systemic failure of our economy. How do the Chinese, do they have a lot of suggestions for how we could improve as well as we have for them? Well, they're quite open with their <laughs> suggestions. I think that the, um, it's always difficult to generalize about what the Chinese people think about anything. It's a, you know, it's, it's a big country with, uh, it's, and um, very diverse, really. Um, but I think um, in general, if, if I'm going to generalize, so I think in general they have a very idealized vision of the United States, much more so than, than, than I've I found so far in, than in Russia. Um, they, 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 weren't, they weren't in favor of this war in Iraq, and they weren't, um, they weren't uh, uh, I, I don't think they were very concerned about the election in 2000. They watched this. The government tries to use these types of things to tarnish the American image, but I don't think they get very far. Uh, I think there's, um, among people-to-people -people relations, there's still quite a bit of admiration for what, uh, what we have here in the United States. Um, and I think that's, that's quite different uh, so f than, than my experience has been in Russia. I think um, that uh, the feeling in Russia is that democracy in the United States is as corrupt as it is in Russia. That a lot of people think that way. Um, I think that's, that's what the propaganda has been, been designed. Way in the back. Uh, Jeff Laurenti, the Century Foundation. In the early years of the communist regime, an upwardly aspiring party cadre would have this, the sense that in order to advance within the party, <coughs> you have to reach out and mobilize workers or peasants or some kind of outreach into the society in order to further whatever is the campaign du jour of the party leadership in Beijing. One has a sense that the party no longer has these kinds of campaigns trying to whip up public interest or mobilize the public, and that an upwardly aspiring party hack now simply has to suck up to party bosses up ahead and has no connection with the society at large at a time when the party appears to be occupying the space that the old Guomindang did as the representative of the business elites rather than of the working and the poor and all that that had been the communists' lever into power. What today, in fact, are the metrics by which an upwardly aspiring party hack can hope to advance himself in the society, mm -hmm. and does that then leave the society at large utterly divorced from those who are its uh, you know, future political leaders and create a, a wider space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, the key metric for advancement in the party right now is economic growth. If you can deliver economic growth in your piece of territory that you're in charge of and, and you build some projects that look good, uh, you can get promoted. And this is one reason, you know, by being so single-mindedly focused on this, the party has been quite successful at achieving this growth, at getting foreign investors to come in. Um, on, on the other hand, by being so focused on this one metric, they've let a lot of other things slide. And um, there are a few, there, there are right now efforts within the party organization to try to introduce new metrics I into this, uh, into, into the, what's considered for advancement, including, uh, you know, there's some different formulas for judging whether they're doing enough to protect the environment. I don't think that's really taken off yet. There are some um, efforts, well, the, the old one uh, of uh, enforcement of the one-child policy is still a key uh, uh, factor for promotion. In fact, it's, if you are uh, found to be lax in, in enforcing that, that'll be a reason why you won't get promoted. It's more of a negative factor. Um, but there is also, uh, we, I talked about these protests that are happening all the time. Um, Philip. Could you give us the rationale for wanting to keep the one-child policy going in a time in which they have a population that is aging faster than any in history, in which you're going to, <clears throat> if anything, need more workers, not fewer? Yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's primarily uh, inertia that mm -hmm. there. Uh, you know, 
I talked about how this government is insecure and how the party leadership is insecure. They are reluctant to, they, I think that even within the party, within the government, there's a recognition that this one-child policy is no longer needed, that it's m more costly. It's counterproductive. Right? It's counterproductive, A, and then B, it's costly to the party's reputation. These yeah. sort of very forceful tactics that they sometimes have to use against the, their, their own people, um, that it only tarnishes their reputation further. I think you had but a figure in the book that they had almost 500 million abortions. I, I don't I remember the figure, but it's quite high. Yeah, it's very high. Yeah. But the, the leadership is nervous. They don't want, they don't want it. none of these leaders wants to be the one who proposes to change it because they're worried, oh, if we change this and then the population takes off and then it's going to be a drag on economic growth as a result possibly, then I'll be blamed and I'll lose, I'll lose power. Somebody else will be able to fight his way to the top. So you know, these sort of bold initiatives that are needed uh, right now, we talked about what, what's wrong with the political system. You know, this, is, this is one of the failures of the political system. They, they, they can't shake off some of these old decisions that are not no longer needed. Stephen. <clears throat> uh, Stephen Schlesinger, the Century Foundation. Um, two questions. First of all, um, what impact has the limited or somewhat limited freedoms of Hong Kong had on China? And second of all, uh, when you were a journalist there, were you shadowed on a regular basis by the Chinese? Not on a regular basis. Um, occasionally, during sensitive, what they consider politically sensitive periods, there would be someone, who sh you know, show up in a car and follow me around for a little while. But uh, they, uh, we assumed that you know they were monitoring our communications and all the time, and so we, we, we took we tried to take precautions and not to try to get people in trouble. Um, as for Hong Kong, you know, it's it's the the hope had been when when Hong Kong went back to China that Hong Kong would change China. I think on balance, it's, it's happening more in the other direction. That China has changed Ch uh, Hong Kong more than Hong Kong has changed China. Now, across that sort of southern region next to Hong Kong, um, I think sort of Hong Kong's values, especially the, its media freedom values, has, has already penetrated in, in, in Guangdong. And I write in the book about these newspaper editors who were, you know, who essentially uh, tried to run a real, you know, tabloid newspaper with, with what was a commodity in short supply, you know, criticism of the government. It was quite successful. I mean, I think they really um, were influenced by what was uh, what they saw just across the border in Hong Kong. They had spectacular circulation growth. They did until they were shut down. Right? Until they were shut down, yeah. <laughs> but before they were shut down, they you know this they they yeah. managed to um, <clears throat> have a real impact on public policy. They managed to shut. They did an investigation of these detention centers um, that were you know quite abusive, and then the government backed down and shut down these detention centers. So, it's, you know, there is prog progress possible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Travana Weschler, Security Council Report. Looking at China now from Moscow, where some of the most spectacular business careers went up in flames, and these careers actually happened because of the connections to the communist former Communist Party, do you think a little bit differently about the careers in China and about some of the people you wrote about who were or are still very, very successful business-wise, but do you, do you think their future may be in question? Um, I, I think it's a very different business uh, situation. Um, the, the, the process of privatization went forward much faster and uh, much more chaotically in Russia. And so you, the sort of billionaires that you see in Russia, you know, they, they call them the oligarchs because they really exercise true political power there. In China, it's not quite that way. Uh, you know, they're not even, I think they're not even done really privatizing the state economy. And so it's, uh, they, you don't have um, um, the sort of the oligarchical, you know, huge, very powerful billionaires that you did in, in Russia. Um, this, this woman I, I wrote about, the, the rich lady, she was one of the richest women in China, but, you know, her political power is quite limited, I think. And um, her, uh, and she, she didn't aspire to that. I mean, her, her assets were, were a fraction of what these, these men that we, we see in, in Russia are. So it's, it's, it's pretty different. Was it, um, was it a full-length cashmere coat she made you take when you left? I, well, yeah, I guess I did take it. But I gave it to, <laughs> I gave it to charity. I gave it to charity. She really re re refused to, to, um, to, to let me <clears throat> leave without taking it. And then she actually put cash in the pocket of this jacket, too. Yeah. It's... Um, See, we got some real estate people here who could learn the lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. 
uh, Minky Warden from Human Rights Watch. Congratulations on Thank a you. great contribution to uh, understanding China. <coughs> You had talked about the importance of individual cases, and one of the most interesting developments over the last decade has been just how many domestic lawyers inside China were willing to take up these cases. But there's been a, a fairly devastating setback of a num the top tier of those lawyers, some of whom have even appeared here at the council. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them lost their law licenses, a sort of wholesale disbarment earlier in the month. Can you talk about the implications of that and how hard it will be to rebuild that community? Yeah, it, it, it was sort of overdue. We were expecting the government to, to make some type of move against these lawyers. Um, and it had been a sort of a gradual process where they started to tighten uh, their grip, uh, just first starting with harassment, then there were some arrests, and then, then the disbarment. Um, I don't think they're going to succeed in completely shutting that down. I, I really think that um, sort of the ideas uh, that these lawyers represent are out there now. And there's a generation of uh, young lawyers coming up that are going to be influenced by that. Um, the problem is that the, the, the remaining lawyers and the new ones coming up, they're going to face the same challenges and problems that these lawyers who just shut down or had to face. They're going to have to decide at some point you know, whether, if, if the government continues to be as tough as it has been, and, and, and in many cases, as you, as you know, Minky, they, they resorted to violence, beating up lawyers and such. These lawyers are going to have to face the same dilemma. Do we continue to push um, or do we try to reach some kind of compromise, some kind of accommodation with the state? Um, I, I don't think anyone sort of figured out what the best strategy is when you, when you face that kind of situation. It, I mean, it, it's a, a little bit of a stretch, but it recalls, I think, wh what we had here in the United States during the Civil Rights Movement. You know, you had these activists who were pushing for civil rights, and then they were they faced violence, and they decided to keep pushing, and, and, and eventually succeeded. Um, whether that type of movement could develop or succeed in China, I think it's, it's tough to say. Seymour. <clears throat> Thank you once again for a great book. Uh, in October, the Central Committee uh, passed a series uh, of laws uh, and programs uh, to uh, improve conditions in peasant leasing of land, raising farm income, and so on. At the same time, quite frankly, the comments of the Central Committee uh, indicated that the, one of the great problems was compelling local officials to fulfill uh, these uh, programs. Do you think that uh, the programs will succeed, and will they be able uh, to quiet and uh, and uh, put down or deal with uh, the uh, violent peasant protests all through the, the rural areas? I, I think um, some of these programs may succeed, uh, and uh, but they're they're going to always have a problem of local officials in these communities are essentially have unchecked power. Now, they're not accountable to the, to the villages and to the peasants. They're, they're in, and in that type of situation, there's going to be abuse of power. And so they, you know, when I was reporting in China, um, the, the key issue in the countryside was, was taxes. You know, the, these officials were basically extracting as much money as possible from peasants. They were taking more um, in taxes from the peasants than they could make in a year on uh, farming. And so the f these families had to send their children to the, to the cities in order to send back money just to pay the taxes. You know, the government realized, you know, there were all sorts of protests over this, and the government realized this was a problem, and they basically eliminated the taxes. But now the, 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 the problem in the countryside is that the officials are taking the land of the peasants, and they're using, this, you know, they're using it for development, selling it to developers. Um, so I, I think, you know, when you don't have accountability from the bottom, and it's just this top-down directive, some of these directives will be achieved. But as long as there's no uh, bottom-up accountability, I think there's always going to be abuses. And I think that's you know, one of the problems with this political system. Is the top ranks reasonably corruption-free? No. <laughs> that's, uh, I, that makes it even more difficult. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big pyramid. I think there's certainly, well, I don't know if, if there are any uh, officials at the top levels that are corruption-free. I mm. think it's, it's endemic in the system. It's not as bad as in Russia. Um, as far as I could tell, 
but it, it is part of what keeps the system going. Officials become officials in, in China so they can take bribes, and then they, they get promotions so they can get bigger bribes, and so it, it keeps it going. In back. Maura McLean with the African American Institute. How much, if at all, does the regime care about uh, the largely Western critique of uh, the government's or, or China's engagement with Africa? Uh, deforestation, uh, purchasing tracts of land to produce um, uh, food for people in China, uh, exportation of pre peasants. Uh, do they care about that uh, critique? I, I think uh, they... And one other question is, is it true that uh, the, the Chinese public isn't particularly enamored of Barack Obama and that the reason for that has to do with the exportation of negative Hollywood images of African Americans? Hmm. I, you know, I haven't been back in China since um, the election or even since the campaign, so I, I really I can't speak to that. Um, there's, like I said before, there's, a, there's a, a degree of racism in Chinese society, and part of it is out of ignorance and lack of contact with the rest of the world. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, um, the media stereotypes that actually per perpetuates it there. Um, but the, the other question about whether they're, they're responsive or they're sensitive to the critique of their behavior in Africa, I, I think they are. I think that it goes to what I was saying. They want to be seen as a respected world power. Um, and there's a debate within Chinese intellectual circles right now, foreign policy circles, about what, chi what it means to be um, a responsible world power. What does China represent in the world? And the, uh, if you know, there are some who argue we, sh we shouldn't be doing this type of thing in Africa, or, and others say you know, all, we're, all we're about is about uh, profit and keeping ourselves in power. So this is a, a debate that's going on, and, and I think um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it gets resolved. I think ultimately it'll, uh, it'll be the, the sort of form of the political system that is going to determine, though, what they do on the foreign policy front. Yes. <clears throat> Ed Cox with Patterson Belknap. Uh, we see the activist individuals you write about through Western human rights traditions. How much are they really an outgrowth of Chinese cultural and political traditions as opposed to the way we see them. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's legitimate. It's not something I've really studied, but I do know that all across Chinese history there, have, there is sort of this figure of the, of the honest official or the honest, you know, in some cases the honest lawyer or honest activist, but often it's an official, a magistrate, um, who is willing to take on sort of the entrenched corrupt um, uh, interest groups uh, within the government. Um, so that's, that's a tradition that exists. Um, it's, the, the, these people, they often do draw upon Western um, ideas and Western, uh, t even Western textbooks. I mean, this one lawyer I wrote about who uh, was a, a challenging a, a libel suit against these writers, the party officials sued these two writers, and um, this lawyer was fighting back. And he, do, he, he, he referred directly to sort of U.S. Supreme Court <laughs> decisions in his argument in Chinese court. So I think the sort of Western tradition is, is quite influential there, but I think there is this sort of submerged Chinese tradition as well that exists, and um, I think perhaps you know for the movement to be successful, they may need to draw more upon that. And there's been there's been discussion among some of these intellectuals about it. Yes, sir. I was fascinated by your uh, statement. Oh, Henry Jackman from the United Nations Development Program. Uh, the struggle to define the past. And since 1979, the first time I had the privilege of knowing China, I have been in awe like the rest of the world. I don't think in the history of the world there's been such a transformation at such a scale, certainly in the area of poverty. Mm. No one's ever done what these people have done. And the idea of history kept coming to me because in 79, I came to a very crude idea that Mao was the reestablishment of the imperial tradition that breaks down in 1911. And Tiananmen really was the fear of 1911, I think, for student riots. And the history of democracy there is very weak, very poor, non-existent. And so I'm wondering, out of this, how do you invent uh, a democracy? And, and, and as an unrelated question, but perhaps related, uh, was the Olympics, was that a, a, a manifestation of the new China? Did that, did that create that new identity? But going back to the struggle and defining history, mm -hmm. is all that ancient history, how is that interpreted? It's all part of that identity, isn't it? And, and the Olympics, 
and all of that. How do you invent the democracy in that? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process. Um, history, the, um, they're quite conflicted about ancient Chinese history. They, they, um, they're quite proud of it. That on, on the one hand, they always talk about how China is a, a nation with a 5,000 year history. On the other hand, the official history will say that everything before 1949 was awful, evil, yeah. But th I think they're starting to reassess that. People are, are, are arguing about whether that was, is <coughs> accurate. And um, the most sensitive period of history that they, they feel is critical for them to control is this period from 1949 through 79 when Mao was in power. You know, it's the party's sort of identity is really tied up with Mao, and they, f they, f they haven't felt able to sort of abandon it yet. And um, they spend a lot of time uh, trying to control how that is viewed. But it's starting to get out. You know, I write about a, a filmmaker who, who, who devoted five years of his life to researching a, uh, a poet who was executed during the Cultural Revolution. And um, you know, there, are, there are people like that all across the country who are trying to, they don't, they don't want it to, that, the, the truth of what they see as history as, as, of, of, of being lost. You know, how does democracy emerge from that? You know, I haven't studied it closely enough. I mean, it's happened in, in other countries. Um, I think there is, as I said, there's a group of people who would like to see it happen, and they're, they're pushing for it. How do they gain enough support in society to make it happen? Uh, maybe, maybe it'll never happen, you know, whether they're willing to make the kind of sacrifices that are necessary to make it happen. That's a good starting point. Does it have, like, a party, No. Is there, is there an opposition party? No. No. And this is, this is another thing that's quite different um, from the situation in, in Russia. But on the other hand, you know, they are, um, you know, this, this grassroots activism, they've sort of realized that sort of directly forming a party, confronting the, 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 uh, the, uh, the state isn't effective because that was the lesson they drew from 1989 in the Tiananmen Massacre. So they're trying to do it in other ways. Whether, whether that can succeed, uh, I don't know. But I think, I think they have made some progress. Let me add a footnote to this. Um, unlike Russia, which literally never had a period of uh, democratic governance or of democratic philosophizing, uh, China really did. It's at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, and Orville Schell wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs about 10 years ago saying, when China's ready for a starting point to start going democratic, they have their own set of philosophers and who wrote brilliant pieces at the turn of the century as to what the democracy is, how it works, why it should be applied, and so on. If you want democracy with Chinese characteristics. None of us have ever heard about this, in part because the... Of war Pardon? Of no, I'm talking now about philosophers. Yeah, no, there was, the, I'm not saying it was ever put into practice. But the reason that we hardly even know about it is because the uh, communist regime, when it came in, literally erased this chapter in Chinese history. They did not want it sitting there as an example of something that might be thought and might be acted upon someday. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sharon Hong from Human Rights in China. Congratulations. Thanks, Sharon. That's wonderful achievement. Um, I wanted to say a quick comment uh, that underscores uh, the underlying theme of your book, and that is that both Charter 08, despite coming out in December and throughout January and February and ongoing, that the signers have been summoned and detained and arrested and Liu Xiaobo now being charged uh, is, is a clear message. But despite all that, it's important to remember that the signatures kept growing and that as of May, there were over 8,000 and 80% of those signatures are still coming from inside China. So I think that's a hopeful message of what you're saying is mm -hmm. that people will continue. Um, the Hong Kong, I, I wanted to ask Patricia a little bit more to comment a little bit more on the role of Hong Kong because yeah. it is true that 20 years, we've had 20 years of enforced amnesia uh, about Jim Fourth, for example. But yet, in Victoria Park, over 100,000 people. And then you have millions of tourists, students, business coming back and forth across this quite permeable border now between mm -hmm. Hong Kong and the mainland beyond the South. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I think a lot is going on there. So some of this cultural exchange question of what is actually, because they're actually radically different questions, being Hong Kong Chinese myself, mm -hmm. but I think it's just a totally different culture. And you're seeing the culture clashes in Hong Kong between the mainlanders yes. and local Chinese. And, and I, I, you know, I, I see that when you're caught in the middle of it. So what do you think, pushing a little bit more beyond Hong Kong, yes, absolutely being influenced by Beijing, but th there's 
more potential. So what do you see there? Do you see well, I think you're right. There's a lot of potential, and you see it right across the border from Hong Kong. That in Guangdong province is probably the most free wheeling and free politically of the of the of the regions in China. Um, there have been proposals from scholars and, and even I think some officials in in that region to establish uh, special political zones um, when, in Guangdong. Just as the, the sort of market reforms that Deng Xiaoping um, initiated began with special economic zones where you would, you would allow experimentation with uh, with markets. There have been proposals to sort of create special political zones in Guangdong where you would allow experimentation with a more democratic system with with freedom to speak with free newspapers. And none of these proposals have gotten anywhere yet. But the fact that they're made and they're discussed and debated, I think that's, I think that's important. And I, you know, I think it would be smart for the, the party to try something like that. Because talking about this transition <coughs> to democracy, it will go a lot smoother and it will be a lot uh, more effective if the party leads it itself, if the leadership uh, is, is wise enough to see that this, this is going to come and it's better for us to, to, to be in front of it rather than behind it. But um, I, I don't see any sign that they're going to do that right now. We have time for one last question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Andrea Friedman from the Global Justice Center, and thank you for a fascinating read. My question is about the growing issue around criminal accountability of the Darfur Genocide Olympics mm. and pressure in the International Criminal Court indictment of Bashir now and pressure around Burma. And do you see, what do you see as China's role towards the International Criminal Court? Is this something they could use to gain more stature in the world, or is this something they want to see go away and marginalized? Um, I, I'm not an expert on that. I, I, I think it, you know, my analysis, you know, without having studied it, would be that they are concerned about their, their own reputation because of domestic situation. And I think they're quite vulnerable to all these sort of international campaigns. They don't quite understand why there's so many people in the world concerned about Darfur or concerned about Burma. But um, they understand that if they don't want to be caught on the, alone on the, on the wrong side of it and have too much attention. Of, of the, they, they're worried about turning into the bad guy you know, in international relations. And I think this type of public pressure has an impact on their policies. I think we've seen some shift in, in their Darfur policies as a result of this. Not, not really significant, but I think um, you know, the, the more uh, sort of criticism and, and attention there is to these issues, I think they do respond. Philip, your book's a compelling read. It's also, I think, um, a very important testament to some very brave people and the efforts they're making. So congratulations. I can't wait for the Russian book. Well. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.